Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Aisha Tyler. A tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! What's up? What is up? I'm your host, Elia Einhorn. Welcome back to the Talk House Podcast. We have some fantastic artists on today's show. You ready for this? You ready? Michael Shannon in conversation with Jason Narduzzi. To help me introduce this week's show, I am very pleased to welcome back to the TalkHouse podcast, the man here in studio with me, TalkHouse film editor-in-chief, Nick Dawson. Thank you. Present here, correct. And in Chicago, TalkHouse's executive editor, Josh Modell. Hello. Thank you for phoning me up today, as usual. Josh, tell us how this talk came together, man. I'd be happy to. So the impetus for today's conversation, strangely, is a musical. But it's a musical about a punk rock band formed by Jason Narducci, who some of our listeners will probably know from Super Trunk and Bob Mould's band and his own band, Split Single. He had a punk band when he was 11 years old called Verboten. He was approached by a fellow Chicagoan about turning his young life story into a play. And over the last five years, he and some very talented people from the House Theater of Chicago have been working on turning it into a musical, and it just opened. And it's fantastic. I saw it with my wife and son a couple weeks ago. It's playing through March 8th at the Chopin Theater. The songs are great. The story is great. And it led to this conversation with Jason and his friend Michael Shannon, who is no stranger to Chicago theater himself. Now, Jason formed the band Verboten when he was just 11. That's right, 11 years old, and the pictures are amazing. There's these cute kids just ready to rip it up. Well, you won't believe this, Josh, but their bassist, Chris Keen, became my high school homeroom teacher. He was Mr. Keen, who had told me he'd played in a band as a teenager and opened, if I remember this correctly, for like Metallica or something. But it was no big deal, he said. (laughs) Of course. It did become a big deal, though, in part due to Dave Grohl. That's right. The spark for the play came from the House Theater's David Nevue, who saw an episode of Dave Grohl's Sonic Highways on HBO. This was Dave's documentary series about music. Now, one of Dave Grohl's biggest musical influences, weirdly, was Verboten. His cousin, Tracy, was the singer of Verboten. And when Dave was a kid, he came and visited Chicago. He saw them rehearse, and it made him think, I can do punk rock. So Verboten is not just the the funny story of these kids in Evanston, Illinois. It's also the story of the spark of Dave Grohl, weirdly. It's amazing. And Josh, thank you so much for sending us these awesome clips of the infants of uh, Verboten rocking out. Yeah, it's fantastic. So they just found their original demo tape, uh, one copy of their original demo tape. Nobody had it. Uh, And then Jason pressed up 500 copies on vinyl kind of to celebrate the opening of the play. From that seven inch, here is a very young Jason introducing one of their tracks. Check it out. Hello, I'm Jason Arducey, the guitarist for Verboten. This next song is called Leave Me Alone, and it sounds exactly like this. Sliding looks, attachment scene, depressing crooks are always boring. I mean, these kids fucking rocked, am I right? They certainly did. And somebody else who rocks in so many different ways is the man talking to Jason Narducci today, Michael Shannon. All of us at TalkHouse are are huge Michael Shannon fans, and it's very cool to have him on the show. And he is like in full Michael Shannon mode. I I didn't know what to expect, Nick. He's such a chameleonic actor, but he is a Chicago guy, it turns out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To the max. Our producer, Mark, and I grew up in Chicago. As regular listeners will know, we've talked about this before, but Mark worked at a record store, see here, just around the corner from Michael's Old Theater and would see him in there buying records all the time. Man of the people. Man of the people. And uh, a big music fan, which is how we come to having these two guys together. They're old friends, and they met because they were in a cover band together that was put together by Robbie Folks, who coincidentally has written some articles for TalkHouse. Yeah, and Michael has his own band as well. He's the singer and songwriter in Corporal. Let's check out a clip of their track, Sick. Is it too much to expect that you confused corpse be lifted and carried up to the high? 
It's a lovely track, and he's a great musician as well. He really is. But of course, he's best known for his amazing acting chops. Most recently, I got to catch him in Knives Out, which was absolutely delightful. That was the Ryan Johnson film. Friend of the show, friend of the show. Yeah, no, that's, that's an awesome movie. And it's funny, I, I think the first time that I really became aware of him when I saw him in a really big role was in Shotgun Stories, which is a, a Jeff Nichols' first movie. And of course, Michael and Jeff have worked together on, I think, almost every movie that Jeff has ever made. And it's funny because like at the time, I was like, God, this guy looks really like Richard Keel. He you know, played Jaws in, right. the, in the James Bond movies. You know, he's yet to make a Richard Keel biopic. But, but you know, he's, he's, he did developed into this incredible, as you say, sort of chameleonic actor. And he, he sort of perfectly straddles the worlds of, of studio movies, of Hollywood movies, and independent film, TV, and also with theater. And he's just, like, all over the map in, in such an interesting way from, you know, as you said, like Knives Out, The Man of Steel, to Shape of Water, to all the movies he made with Jeff Nichols. Uh, you know, he's in Bad Boys too. Nick, you touched on this quickly. He is a very respected stage actor. He co-founded a Red Orchid Theater in Chicago. He's appeared at Steppenwolf on the West End in London, Off-Broadway in New York. This guy does it all. In their conversation here, Michael and Jason cover a lot. Of course, we hear all about the genesis of the show Verboten, but so much more. We hear about how they met because of an obscure Lou Reed record. The great evolution of musicals. Michael talks about the dirty laundry in Chicago's theater world. Ooh, it gets aired. Some fantastic Chrissy Hines stories. And also stories of Michael working on Knives Out. And the great Chicago debate. Is Cheap Trick the best band or merely one of the best bands? (laughs) Should we roll the tape? (laughs) Let's roll the tape. Hey, Mike. Hi, John. (laughs) I told you this this would be challenging. (laughs) Um, this sure beats walking around on the sidewalk. Right? Well, not really. Um, hi, Jason. I think probably three or four times that we've hung out, I've started to say something and you said, hold it. Save it for the podcast. Yeah, well, I knew it it was all kind of coming to this end. And here we are. Yeah. And now I can't think of anything to talk about. Well, what's your full name? Jason. But how do you say your last name? Narducci. And a lot of people say Narducci, don't they? do. They? Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Um, well, originally it was CCI, and it got changed, uh, I think, three generations ago. My great-great-grandfather had a hard time finding work in America. Because was he an anarchist? He was Italian. I know. Was he an anarchist? No. Okay. But they... Uh, they were prejudiced at the time, so it's pretty odd that you could just change it to see why and get work, but it's stuck. Mm. And there aren't many of us, so there's the see why. There's, it's easy to Google my name and, and get right down to it. Have you ever thought about changing it back? No. Mm. I'm such a mutt now. I don't, I don't even look Italian. I've got German and English and Irish and Native American even. I can see that, a little Native American. Yeah. It's a shame this is a, a podcast because <laughs> uh, no one else can, but I, I can see it. You see it? Yeah. Um, I would guess no one mispronounces your name. Michael Shannon? No. Who does that? No, that's how it's pronounced. Really? But nobody ever says it properly. So it's French? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'm about 98% French. You're making this up. No. Really? Um, Why no, isn't it one end in the middle, then? No, that would be... Uh, oh, you're right. Yeah, I guess that's the way it should be spelled. Sorry. No, it is. It's uh, Michael Shannon. Catch out of the bag. That's who's talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, how how do we uh, know each other? Through Robbie Falks. Robbie Falks used to have his Monday night hideout shows where he would come up with a new music theme, and he wanted to do a Lou Reed record and asked you to sing and asked me to play bass. Which record? The weird one. You can't remember. Blue Mask. Very good. Nobody knows that record. No. <laughs> I didn't know that record before he asked me to play it. I, I was confused because I had seen Robbie do that show, and he he's pretty good at singing himself, so oh, I didn't man, really understand yeah. why... He wanted me to do it. Yeah, he's infuriatingly talented. Yeah, and very tall. You're both very tall. 
He's taller than me, though, isn't he? Is he? He's kind of like Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four. <laughs> just imagine him just reaching his hands out over the audience <laughs> and, and tying everyone up. Yeah. Where I haven't seen Robbie in a long time. He moved to L.A. That's such a good idea. L.A.'s great. Oh, well, speaking of L.A., Jesus Christ. I'm still in shock about this whole, uh, this crash. Yeah, Kobe. Kobe, yeah. It's so devastating. And he was with his daughter. Yeah, and eight other people or seven other people or something. But they seemed very close. I mean, you only have the pictures to go by, but wow, yeah. they, they seemed very close. And you have a young uh, daughter that you're, you're very close Ten with. Ten-year-old, yeah, Eva. She was at... The performance I attended of your new musical. Verboten, yes. Which is called Verboten. Yeah, thanks for coming to that and coming to uh, get pizza beforehand. Yeah, well, that was, uh, that was some spicy pizza. <laughs> but uh, that's how I roll. Peace, Peace yeah. Pizza on North. Peace. Co-owned by Mr. Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. Holy moly, one of your idols, I total, believe. Total idol, yeah. You love the Cheap Trick. I love Cheap Trick. We've kind of we've gotten into this once before. I'm not sure I I get it. They pulled cheap trick me, but it's it's all right. <laughs> What's their best song? Ooh, he's a whore. He's a whore. Mm-hmm. All right, I'll check it out. No wait. On top of the world. On top of the world. No wait. There's too many. There's too many. There's, uh, I love them. But yeah, thanks for coming to Verboten. That's uh. Going through this process and having seen so many of plays that you've been in or directed here in Chicago at Red Orchid, I have so many questions about the the process that you enjoy the most about it. All doing plays? Yeah. Well, we can get to that. It's interesting because you, uh, you collaborated with Brett Nevue, mm -hmm. who wrote the, uh, I think you call it the book, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the scripted parts of the scenes. And then you wrote all the music and all the lyrics. And this is based on a band that you had when you were young. Mm -hmm. But the songs are new songs, right? There's one original Verboten song in the play. Now, which one is it? Uh, it's near the end, I think. I don't want to give it away, but I think oh, there's, right. the screen drops. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, not, let's, not, <laughs> let's, not do, let's not give that away. <laughs> But I got to say, there's a song in the show that I just cannot get out of my head. It's mm. just like stuck in my head. It's actually a refrain. It, it comes back uh, again and again in the show about uh, you, you belong. Mm -hmm. So you wrote that song. Yeah, that's so I think there's 20 songs that I wrote for the musical and three of them the music and melody were from songs that I had previously written, and that's one of them. That is a song, and this is, I've made a number of poor career choices, and one of my poor decisions was to name one of my bands when I was in my 20s, Verbo, which mm -hmm. is just too close to Verboten. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, it's very confusing. Um, but Verbo, Why do you think you did that? Well, we were called Skinny, which I thought was a good name because Allison and I together wet probably weighed a buck fifty at the time. Yeah, you don't have that problem anymore, oh, do you? Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's all those beers with yeah. you at the Ale House. Yeah. Um, Allison was the cellist in Verbo, and um, we were called Skinny, and that name was used by an artist in Europe, and we couldn't get the trademark or whatever. We couldn't get the copyright. So Someone we, can copyright oh, Skinny? Oh, whatever it is. Yeah, I guess. Or there was a, a, a musical group that had that name in Europe, and... It conflicted. Not anymore. Skinny Puppy. No, it wasn't Skinny Puppy. I thought that would be the problem, but that wasn't the one. Hmm. So then you had to switch. Yeah. And then, uh, so then was Verbo the second name? <laughs> no, I don't even remember what other choices. Uh, Big Mac. You tried Big <laughs> Mac for a while, and then you, you get some legal trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they didn't like that. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, so V E R B O is the Spanish word for action, verb, to take action. Oh, yeah. And then we added the W at the end as a reference to the, the strings, to ch cello right. in the rock band. So totally unconnected. Yeah. And yet everybody probably asks you, 
So Why do you close have... friends did because when that band existed, no one was talking about Verboten. It was just this band I had when I was a kid. It wasn't until much later when there was a documentary about Chicago punk rock called You Weren't There that covered Verboten, and then Dave Grohl's Sonic Highways on HBO brought that band back into the light. And that's what Brett saw and inspired him to write the... the so he reached out to you after he saw that? Yeah, I didn't know him. Oh, really? But our daughters went to... Or our kids went to the same... Same juvie home? Grade school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> grade school, yeah. Um well, but and you're both you're both Evanstonians, mm-hmm. Evantonians. Yeah, how do you say it? Evanstonians. Yeah, Evanstonians. Yeah, but that song and thank you for for mentioning that. I like that song too. But that's it's very haunting. It's very powerful. I keep trying to figure it out. Like it just seems to have a tremendous amount of longing in it. And you hear a lot of music that seems to have a lot of longing in it, or seems to be attempting to have a lot of longing in it but it's just kind of overbearing or, you know, sappy or whatever. But there's, it's, there's a very genuine, I don't know, it seems like it has a piece of you in it somehow, mm. which is a very mysterious thing with music. Because at the yeah. end of the day, it's just notes and mm-hmm. sounds. Yeah. But you can put yourself in there yeah. somehow. Yeah, that one was originally written for my wife, Emily. It was called Crest of Mary. Hmm. And um, when Brett wrote the script, at the end of every scene, he would list a few songs that had the tone that he thought maybe would be appropriate for that scene. And he had this song by The Jam. I, I want to say it's called Desert Rose or something like that, but it's an acoustic song. And I thought, I already have a song that sounds, got this kind of tone to it. And um, I changed the lyrics and submitted it, and they were very happy with it. And then I used it again, as you said, in the play. Well, why not? Yeah. I mean, if you get some. Yeah. And it makes sense that it keeps returning. It's interesting to see when it comes back in different scenes and even different people singing it. Right. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's, that's, some, that's, a, that's a tool that you see in, in musicals. Uh, the, re- the refrain or yeah. whatever it's called. Yeah, I don't know what it's called either. Yeah, it's my yeah. first musical. Now, when you say you submitted it, it sounds like there was a like a board of, of like the star. Yeah, chamber that's or I guess something. that's a poor choice of words because they nothing was rejected. Right. Um, it's but, really just you and Brett, right? What and there's Nathan, a director, right? Nathan Allen. Yeah, Nathan Allen over at the House Theater. Is he related to Ethan Allen? I don't think so. No, and he um, runs the House Theater. The House Theater, yeah. And I'm assuming are most of the people listening to this in Chicago, would they know what that is? Or are there people in, like, the Marshall Islands listening to this? Who's listening to this, Josh? Everyone everywhere. Oh, so it's maybe, world, we're worldwide. Okay, so it's the House Theater in of Chicago. Chicago. Yep. And they've been on quite a run for a number of years. Yeah. You know, it's, it's such a personal story, and... Uh, Brett, I thought Brett did a great job of capturing the spirit of the band while also taking some poetic license and embellishments that, you know. Well, it's tricky because it's it's your story and and your fellow bandmate's story. And Brett was not, like you said, uh, was not around then during this part of your life. So there must have been some uh, trust from you mm-hmm. in terms of saying, okay, Brett, I mean, how did you start off? Did you just sit him down and say, so here's what happened? <laughs> he interviewed all of us. He interviewed each member. Okay. Um, and, and then he'd come back to me and ask more questions, and, and I would ask them questions. I don't remember everything exactly. I was so young. And then he really took, you know, he, he took some other turns that were not exactly what happened, and that's why we call it fictional characters based on real events. But... um He's just such a talented and efficient writer, you know, just with the simplicity that just cuts right to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I felt that when I was watching it. It was very, it didn't even really seem like scripted uh, dialogue. It just seemed like these families uh, dealing with each other. Because mm-hmm. there's nothing more annoying when you go to a play and you can see the playwright's hand, you know. Yeah. You really want to get lost in it, and unfortunately, that involves 
accepting the fact that the, your best artistry is probably going to be invisible. That's not something that anybody's going to notice. But it's, they might that's, feel it though. That's the best you can do. Yeah, yeah they might feel it. Yeah. yeah. So, but did you make it clear to Brett at the outset, beyond these interviews, that you had something that you wanted to say or that you wanted to make sure? No. That was no, communicated. No, I didn't have an agenda that way. No. No. He did so many rewrites, though. I want to say, I mean, I wouldn't even know. We've been working on it for five years, so. Well. I think there were three times when I thought it was not going to happen. Why? Um, it just felt like it lost momentum after, you know, we would do like a, we usually did a read-through every summer, and they'd bring in different actors. One time, I brought in a band, and we did it, and we played the songs in sequence along with the, the read-through. And a couple times it just kind of lost momentum and I have to give Brett and Nathan credit for picking it up off the floor and, and, and being diligent about it. I, th I think I was scared. <laughs> I think I was scared of it, you know, in a lot of levels, emotionally. And it's just such a massive undertaking. I mean, this, this is something, again, that you've been working in this world for a long time, but I keep turning, when I'm at the theater, I keep turning and going, oh yeah, here's this other person that makes this thing work. There's a, a large crew and the cast is 11 people and there's, yeah, it's just an incredible process. And um, I'm used to like playing in a, a trio, <laughs> you know, yeah. where, I, where I look over at the guitarist and nod to the drummer and that's it, you know. Right. Maybe a couple Don't crew. Don't forget the sound person. A couple though. crew guys, thank you, Mike. Couple, the all-important sound Very person. important. Tour manager. No, I know what you mean, though. It's, uh, and I suppose, particularly if what you're watching is about, kind of about you, that that's particularly moving to mm -hmm. see all these people making an effort to make your and your bandmates' story available to the general public. Well, and even more moving than that is that they're, they're making it their own. Like, they, right. they care about it. I sense from them that their time and their efforts and their focus is because they feel a piece of it and they want it to be good, not be, to try to make me feel good or anything. But beyond feeling a sense of gratitude for all those people, what is the experience of watching the show uh, like for you? And I say that knowing that there's probably more than one answer to that question. And you've seen it a lot because you just opened and yep. you were at a lot of previews. So yep. you've probably felt a lot of different things. But uh, I was spying on you a little bit while I was watching the show because you were just down the aisle from me. And you had a pretty serious look on your face. And I was thinking, I wonder what he's feeling right now. Are you being hyper critical? Or are you able to just relax and let it... Does it, it stir up, you know, is it cathartic? What is, what's going on? A lot. There's a lot going on. It's mostly, I'm not an anxious person, but I, I feel anxiety sitting in that show. For <laughs> It's weird to write songs and just hand it off to other musicians. And especially in that setting where they're acting and there's moving parts and they're grabbing a guitar off the wall and they're putting a capo on and they're grabbing sticks and they're moving these instruments over here and... It's not like a rock show where you just have the guitar on and you just play that guitar. Yeah. Um, I'm so concerned about something not working or coming unplugged or it's live theater. It's like there's... To that end. Yeah. Was there something going on with the pickup on the bass the night I came? The, Towards the end of the show. Oh, so t my friend Tim Remus plays yeah. the character German Well, he Shepherd. turned up, which I was really excited about because <laughs> I like loud music. Yeah, but he, before that, I noticed when some of the other people were playing the bass that some notes they would hit and I'd hear it and then sometimes they'd hit a note and I wouldn't hear it. It's one of the efforts was to have the instruments be period correct. Mm -hmm. We're not completely there, but that bass is 1974. That could have been a verboten bass. And there are certain characteristics to that yeah, instrument yeah. that... You're, you're battling a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that, though, because I think we could maybe put some compression on it and even it out a little bit, and I'll, I'll mention that to the sound guy because I noticed that, too. The D and the, e, the, D and the G strings kind of go away sometimes. Yeah, well, it's hard to yeah, the EQ a bass, really. And there's three or four different people playing that instrument. 
Yeah. So that's kind of verboten, generally, isn't it? <laughs> you slipped in a foreign word, didn't you? <laughs> um, so, like with Nathan, what qualifies Nathan to, to direct the show? Does he have uh, any history in this uh, arena? Yeah, he's directed. He's also the artistic director for the house. But I mean in terms of rock and roll. Does he have any rock and roll cred? He's a music fan, uh, a rock music fan. Um, a lot of the bands that he, I think he's a little bit younger than me, so he was more of a... Green Day. N- not that band specifically, but 90s punk yeah. rock. Yeah, 90s pop punk is more of his thing. These young punks. Yeah. They don't know. They don't know about Cheap Trick. <laughs> Sorry, I just like to give you a hard time about Cheap Trick. <laughs> But that's it. They're the like Illinois gods, cheap trick. They were my first concert. My yeah. my dad took me to see them when I was ten, which is that story's in the play. I know that's an accurate. That's an accurate one. Sounds like your dad. Your relationship with your dad was pretty complicated. Yeah, it was. It was because it's you know in the play it's it's there's not as much nuance as what existed. You know, there's only the time restraints of a play. You can't go through everything, but. Yeah, he took me to see a lot of concerts. But so Nathan, you said Nathan likes new kids on the block and stuff. So why <laughs> does how how did he did you did he seem to understand the story uh, immediately or how to tell this story? Yeah, he did a great job of, especially at the end. And this is something I wanted to ask you about because the the preview process and the rehearsals, the tech rehearsals around the previews, were times 10 intensity as far mm. as they came back to me. They they wanted a new song. I wrote the kids' song. Oh, that. wow. Nathan wanted different lyrics for three different songs. Not not all of them, but, you know, right here. You mentioned the, the You Belong, Do I Belong mm. theme. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the original second version was Tracy singing Do I Belong after she had earlier told Jason You Belong. And that was a two-verse, two-chorus song just sung by the Tracy character, by Crystal Ortiz. And Nathan said, I would like Crystal to sing the first verse and then to hear from her parents for the second verse. So those lyrics were written, you know, a week ago. Damn. And those are the ones that are, you know, I don't know if you remember that moment, but that's a lot, oh, of, te- a lot of tears in that. Yeah. You know, um, it's an intense moment. And So when Nathan so, says that to you, do you just go, yes, sir, right away, sir? Or are you like, well, wait a minute. I say, well, what, would, what would new kids on the block do? Here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you got the right stuff. <laughs> yeah, see, you're only laughing because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you didn't have, know, you'd twin, be like, I have twin up. sisters who are 13 years younger than me, so yeah, I do, I do know some of them. Um, yeah, well, he would explain it. He would say like, we understand where Tracy's coming from here, but we haven't heard what her parents have to say here. Hmm. I'm like, got it, you know. It was it was very healthy. And then the song is called Set Me Free, but in the scene where Jason and Jason's dad come to blows, Nathan said, when Jason gets cornered like that, the verse before it that his dad sings is not intense enough. Where can you go with that to push him over over the brink? And um, so I rewrote that. And then um, the first song, new song, was three verses of the same lyrics over and over, which is my homage to, to Bob Mould. He has a, the Who's Could Do had a song called New Day Rising, which is three chords and three words, the whole song. <laughs> so I wrote this song called New Song, which was three chords and the same repetitive thing. That's the first song of the play. He wanted to know more about Jason on the outset. So I wrote two new verses for that. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't upset or, but I, I just, part of me was just like, really? We're going to just give these actors these lyrics right. now and they're going to perform it in front of an audience tomorrow? <laughs> you mm. know, that was, that was incredible to experience. And they did it? <clears throat> yeah. Wow. How That's... many times were you involved with a production where there was drastic changes right before it opened? Uh, not too often. No. I mean, I've worked on new stuff. Oh, I guess that's right. The writers it, it mess around new, with it. It has to be a new thing. It can't be something that already existed. Yeah, you because, can't do that yeah, with like, you know, yeah. well, I don't know. People cut Shakespeare and stuff. But uh, yeah, it usually has to be something new. Hmm. 
And then that other song, the, the, the song I think that you write about your dad. Oh, God damn it. How's this start? It's the one that you, uh, you look at, your eyes are full of resentment. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, broken Home. Yeah, Broken Home, yeah. that song. Yeah. That's also a very powerful song. It's interesting because I, as we were talking about before, I was pretty intimidated by this project because, you know, Brett said, well, let's make a musical and you'll write the music. And I'm thinking I've never done anything like that before. But once I went down to my basement and started to kind of dig in, I realized, oh, wait, I get to write all the punk rock songs that Verboten would have liked to have played because hmm. I have more experience now. And I've nice. been, and a song like Broken Home, I could point to you the different songs by a Chicago band called Articles of Faith that inspired that song rhythmically and just the the kind of angular tension of that song is very Articles of Faith. And at one point, the verboten in the musical plays that song slower. And when you slow down those punk rock songs, it sounds like Nirvana. Yeah. Which was funny to me because that's not where I was coming from, but... It's an interesting study of the evolution of that style and of music. That music, yeah. Yeah. Grunge. Grunge, yeah. So grunge is punk slowed down. A lot of it, yeah. Although Nirvana, could, they could go pretty fast They sometimes. did, yeah. yeah. I like that song, Negative Creep. Mm-hmm. Man, I like that song. Mm-hmm. So what are you going to do with these songs? Are you going to do like a cast recording? I would love to. I would love to have that opportunity. I mean, you know some people. You could probably the get cast. some. I know the cast. No, but like a studio time or. Someone. We're sitting in a Chicago studio. We're oh, we're Ch- not going to record it in this dome. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, somewhere professional. I like how you're on the recording now. Yeah, we're not, yeah. We're not I'm gonna producing record. the record. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll get a uh, Albini, Albini. How do you say? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're close. Um. So, this could. Uh, potentially run f- for a while or is it a limited engagement or it's six weeks and um you know if it does well, well I'm, i would hope that they would think about doing another what do they call that extension run yeah production move it broadway relaunch relaunch yeah sure you know did send the <laughs> but show- i like your, i like i like your spirit I broadway like i can see this on broadway <laughs> yeah definitely I just saw, you know what I just saw? You know what I just saw? I just saw a Jagged Little Pill. Oh, how was that? It's fantastic. I went to see that, and, you know, I'd seen a couple other musicals recently that were supposed to be all all the rage. I won't say what they are, but I was actually much more impressed with the Jagged Little Pill. I thought, man, you know, and I remember when that album came out and being like, eh, but she, those are actually really interesting songs. She's got a great voice too. Oh my god! What uh, what's the story about? It's just taking that, uh, the songs and relating it to uh, family. Mm. Uh, it was what you there's to me there's a correlation. I guess yeah. is why I'm thinking of it. Because mm-hmm. you see a family, mother, father, brother, sister, you know, struggling with. They're all struggling with something. And is it uh, a coming of age story? No, it's you know who it's written by is uh, Diablo Cody. She wrote Juno. Oh wow! And yeah, she's a screenwriter. What else she write? She wrote that movie that uh, Charlize Theron was in. She's written a lot of stuff. But anyway, you should. I'd, I'd be interested for you to see that uh, and hear what you thought of it. Because uh, I wouldn't say it's like a the the next phase or something. But there there are a few musicals right now. I, I also heard people talk about like. Dear Evan Hansen, you know, because musicals used to be, like, very fantastical. I mean, there's one even called The Fantastics, you know. Mm -hmm. But now they're beginning more grounded in, like, real people, real stories. Yeah. Things that actually happen, not like, you know, The Music Man or something. Right. No offense to The Music Man. Did you see Fun Home? Fun Home. There's another great example. I thought that was incredible. There you go. Yeah. Maybe that was kind of the advent of it. I don't know. But I'm glad it's, it's interesting to see it moving in that direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think it's, uh, I think it's smart. Because a lot of I, I find a lot of times when I go see musicals, what frustrates me about them is I, I can't relate to them mm-hmm. in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, they don't have any. There's no 
intersection between my experience of life and what I see in a musical. So it's interesting when that changes. You related to Verboten on a certain level? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, I did my time up on the north side. Yeah, you did. I was in Evanston when I was 16. And, uh, gee, I mean, you guys were like, had your shit together compared to me. (laughs) I was totally out of my mind. Did you you tell me that you once... Did you work at the fishbowl? The fishbowl? The fishbowl, yeah. So did Tracy from Verboten. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, we got to talk about that. Barb? Barb. I got fired because I got pissed off at that parrot. <laughs> the parrot that was in there? Well, what did you do? I got into an argument with the parrot in front of the customers. Really? <laughs> and then, not Barb, but the other one, her wife. I can't remember. They said, you got to go. No, the, no parrot arguments that in front job of the public. Sucks, man. Have you ever cleaned a fish tank? Yeah, doesn't smell good. Have you seriously cleaned a fish yeah. tank? Yeah. Do you have not fish? a bit, not one of those big ones? But I, I, oh, my, dude, can you imagine <laughs> cleaning like thirty fish tanks? Just That's spending all day cleaning fish tanks. That's a lot. How often would they have to be cleaned? Well, when Too you often? got a lot of fish in there, yeah, and it's a store, so it can't be like. Right. You can get away with stuff at home yeah. that you can't get away with if you're trying to sell the damn fish. Sell them, right. you know? yeah, they need you're to not work. trying to sell the fish at your house. No. I hope not. No. When you have people over, you're like, it's five bucks. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, had some, I had some North Shore jobs. When you were in that area was... I worked at Homer's. Did you really? Mm-hmm. Scoop and ice cream. I got fired from there, too. The parrot thing again? Well, I threw a pickle at somebody. A parrot? No. Oh. Uh, the, the guy who was behind uh, fry, the frying guy, he said something smart, and I threw a pickle at him. A sliced pickle? Yeah, and quartered. Are a drawn some, and quartered pickle. Was, did Mike Shannon have some anger issues when he was a young no. man? No. No, okay. Calm. Glad we figured Serene. that out. Serene. Glad we figured that That was that my out. nickname. <laughs> Mike Serene Shannon. 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 That's the thing. We, I was well. I was actually talking to Tracy about this. It's like you don't realize when you're that age that the, you feel you can. The tendency is to feel kind of alone. You don't realize that a lot of people might be having similar issues. You look at other kids and think they must be so happy or something. But it's funny how they're all. But that's what's beautiful about your show is you see these these four kids bonding together through music. It's one of the great things about music, I think, is that it brings people together. Mm -hmm. I mean, not necessarily in every instance. I mean, it brought us together. But It did. Yeah. And now we have to do podcasts together. Yeah, forever. What's this one called? Purgatory? (laughs) Um, So, uh, but wait a second. Yeah. Uh, on On a more serious note, have the members of... The band seen the show, all except for our, our drummer. And why hasn't he come? Uh, he's not ready yet. I think he will be at some point. But the other members, uh, Tracy and Scott, Chris, Chris, yeah. Well, how how do they feel about it? They love it. I mean, I'm so thankful that they were willing to go along with this thing where it's not completely accurate. You know. Chris, in the musical, is drinking all the time. Chris didn't drink all the time. He still doesn't, you know. Uh, it was just... What's that called? Straight edge? He's straight yeah, edge? he's not straight edge, but he's... It just... That wasn't his thing. Yeah. And it's so cool that they were also able to let go of things and let it be told in a certain way. And I, and I think they all agree that Brett did a great job of capturing the spirit of the band, which was, you know, there was turmoil at home. We found each other. I mean, it's not said in the musical, but we're all still great friends. And um, we're proud of this little thing that we did when we were kids. Hmm. And I noticed in the lobby here that there's a, some records. For- yeah, we finally released a 7-inch. <laughs> wow. Now, so that's newly printed? Yeah, we had a cassette tape back in the day. 
Uh-huh. Do you know Adam Jacobs, the guy that records every concert in Chicago? Oh, yeah, Long, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, he, he found one. He's oh. the only person that I know that has an original. None of us still have, have the original cassette, but he found one. And uh, so we would just, you know, pass them around at school or sell them at shows. And uh, we thought, well, since this musical is coming out, maybe we'll actually do this. So we did a, a limited 500-piece run. So it's a seven inch. How many songs does it have on it? It has five songs <laughs> yeah, on it. Yeah. Man. Yeah. That's and you're gonna sell them in the in the lobby at the theater? They're at the they're at the show, yeah. We have them people, online too. Online? <laughs> Can um, we uh, you're asking too many questions. Me? Yeah, this is a podcast. We're just like talking. I'm interviewing you. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I don't have anything to say. <laughs> Nothing to say. I really don't. Um I'm also thinking about, you know, how much I want to John Bolton to testify. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm thinking about. How about all of them? Well, yeah, they should all testify. I just, I'm really, you know, I'm, 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 I have a hard time not just being uh, constantly in a state of um, dread. That's why I'm grateful to things like podcasts. To, to help alleviate but the sense of dread. So we can talk about dread. Well, but we avoided it for about, I don't know, 40 minutes. Yeah. But now we're talking about it. But, yeah, it's just really uh, insane. And the speed of, of, of the news right now, like whenever this podcast comes out, they'll be like, Bolton? You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, what new crime happened since, yeah, yeah. since we talked? And the... Yeah. Well, but... You say that, but this has had this has had real staying power. This yeah. whole Ukraine thing. Yeah. They're still claiming that there's no evidence. Right. Hey, Gavolt. <laughs> um, <laughs> anywho, I didn't want to drag it there. I prefer to think about your musical because it's really uh, it's very beautiful and moving, oh, and I sweet, hope yeah. uh, everyone goes to see it. I oh. think they will. Uh, now, I was there the night before. You kind of had two openings, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I was there the night before. And then the next night, there were some special people coming that night, weren't there? The, uh, the critics. The critics. Yeah. They're so special. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you did you watch? From well, the back of the room, my wife Emily and I sat at the way back of the room. Did you watch the critics? No, I couldn't see them, but thankfully it was the best performance of the show today. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, that Saturday was great too. I mean, the, yeah. the the last three have been really special. But that, you um, know, what you should do, you should have a party after every show, and then the next show will be <laughs> yes. it's even better. That was fun. Because that was what we did. That right? was fun. We yeah, the party. Yes, we did. <laughs> That's the key. Yeah. So it was the everything. This is weird. This is weird. You and I hanging out without beers in our hands. Honestly. Yeah. Or out in like bent over in an alley. Yeah, it is weird. We won't we'll, say we'll which get one, to that. We won't say which one of it's us is early. Over. Yeah. yeah, no, we won't. What's the rating on this podcast? It just changed. I think it's a new rating. It's kind of like remember that movie Heavy Metal. Yes, it's like that. You know who's on the Heavy Metal soundtrack, Mike? Who? Cheap Trick. <laughs> well, it's all come full circle. <laughs> that seems like a a perfect ending. <laughs> we have to talk a little bit about your plays here in Chicago. We do? About me? Well, I saw Pilgrim's Progress. You were in that Mm -hmm. at the Red Orchid. I saw Victims of Duty. Mm -hmm. That was Red Orchid. Mm -hmm. And then did you you direct Traitor? Yeah, I directed one of Brett's plays, Traitor, based on An Enemy of the People by Ibsen. Traitor was a modern retelling of that. Yes, set in Illinois. And uh, I directed it. I love that. That was great. Now that's a reinterpretation of a script. So how much do you mess with that? How much? That was between Brett and Ibsen. I, I didn't see. really have much to do with it. I see. It was kind of weird how it came about because okay, so this is it was at a Red Orchid Theater, which is at 1531 North Wall Street in Old Town, the heart of Chicago. And uh, I've been there since the place opened, and uh, so is this other fella named Guy Van Swearingen. He actually started it. 
And we're an ensemble, so we have meetings and we talk about what we want to do. And Guy said, I really think we should do Enemy of the People because of, you know, the times in which we live, yeah. which we were talking about earlier. And I said, wow, that sounds really boring. We shouldn't do that at all. <laughs> Unless we do, like, maybe if, like, Brett wrote some weird version of it, then mm. that would be fun. Mm. And then Brett kind of was slack-jawed and just googly-eyed, staring yeah. at me. Right. And I'm like... For hours. Well, yeah. And then he said, you know what? I I, I think I could do that. And uh, I said, okay. And then Guy got mad because he's he really wanted to do the old one. You're really bringing out the dirty laundry on this podcast, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I get to uh, edit things. It's your podcast. They're yeah. not. They're not here. They're giving it to me when I leave. Uh, um, yeah, they'll get their day in court. But um, <laughs> no, I don't know. He he was very. Guy was very serious about. It. He's like, this is serious, and we need to do not a funny version, but a serious version. And I was like, it won't be that funny. It'll just be kind of more weird and interesting. And I the think I think that's what it was. was it the newspaper clippings? Was the father had like newspaper clippings? Was that part of the Well he had a, a lot huge... of stuff. He smoked weed. Yeah. That was a new thing. Yeah. In the in the original Ibsen uh, he didn't smoke weed. But uh, in this in the modern telling. Yeah. He was a <clears throat> high school science teacher in a dumpy little city uh, that was kind of failing and depressed economically. And, uh, yeah, but I don't want to go, I mean, was Brett changing lines? Of that. Was oh, Brett yeah, yeah, he was making it his own right, right up to the end, voice. Though. Oh, in terms of changing lines? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the playwright's prerogative. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we have a play on right now at our theater, Do You Feel Anger, which is fantastic. I just saw it yesterday. And this is a play that's already been produced twice, but the playwright came in to Chicago from San Diego and she's been watching it and and I, when I saw it yesterday the she had made some changes. Hmm. There was literally one of the actors had a, a script cuz the changes were so new they couldn't possibly remember them. In the show had the script. Yeah, it was hidden in like yeah. a folder or whatever but yeah. That's just for one yeah. particular scene. But anyway, the point being, you know, when you're in previews, that's what previews are all about. Mm -hmm. The process yeah, I, I, that was so cool to watch. I mean, he would just like go into a corner and yeah, turn yeah. it back in, and just all these changes that were made. A lot, a lot of cutting, not a lot of adding. But um, well, yeah, by and large, that's what most people tend to want to do when it gets close to opening the show. Move the story along. Just get rid of yeah. Trim the fat. Yeah. Like any good butcher. Let's talk about all the uh, fantastic uh, gigs you've had okay. over the years. I mean, you played. I had one in Boston where we connected. Do you remember that? What do you mean? Our gig? What gig? Um, oh, yeah. You were playing with Chrissy uh, Hi With the Pretenders, yeah. Yeah. Are you allowed to talk about that? Yeah. Wow. That do was, you remember how that all that came together? Yeah. You, you, it was a, she got hired to play a, a birthday party. Yeah. A private birthday party, so she she brought in John Worcester and I to be the rhythm section, and her usual pretenders guitarist James was there. And the first night we, well, we the first day we rehearsed, and then we went out to dinner, and then we're walking back to the hotel, and Chrissy said to me, and I had just met her that day, but she said, you know, I'm jet lagged, I feel like shit, I'm going straight to the hotel. What are you doing now? And I said, I'm I'm going to meet up with an actor a friend of mine who's in town shooting a movie. And she said, uh, an actor I've heard of? And I said, <laughs> I said maybe, uh, Mike Shannon. <laughs> and uh, she said, she stopped walking. She stopped walking? She stopped. We were walking down the street. She stopped. She goes, Iceman's top three movie for me. Top three? Yeah. She was in, that specific. In her life? She was that specific, yeah. So it's Iceman, Turns <laughs> of Endearment, <laughs> about the and The Green Lantern. <laughs> <laughs> Those are her top three. <laughs> And uh, she said, I want to meet him. And so I, I was already texting with you because we were going to meet up. And I said, Chrissy Hine wants to meet you. <laughs> Do you remember what you wrote back? No. Okie doke. Oh, that? Yeah, I didn't. I, that was, that, that's uh, really strange when uh, people like that uh, want to meet you. That's, uh, I mean, I remember 
in my uh, ute when uh, I was doing plays at Cafe Voltaire. Oh, yeah, in the basement. Cafe Voltaire was a vegetarian restaurant on Clark Street. Across from the alley. And they had a basement. And when I say basement, it, it, <laughs> it wasn't like a refurbished basement <laughs> or a, a basement designed to be a theater. It was a basement. And you could do plays down there for free. You just had to split the door with them. But we did this play about rock and roll that my friend wrote. And one of the songs in it was uh, Middle of the Road. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know, God, 19, 20 when I did that? A long time ago. And I used to hear that song and be like, man, this woman is badass. And then there I am in Boston sitting across the table from her. That was a fun night. I didn't know what to say. I never, I don't really know what to say in those situations. Well, we we hung out for a long time. I, I mean, you saved that story for the very end, which I thought was cool. What story? Middle of the road. You told her about that. I did? Yeah. And you said, you said, I would be remiss if I left here tonight and didn't tell you how much your music meant to me. I said that there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so classy. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Huh. Well, she's one of the legends. Yeah, she's incredible. She's got that uh, CD I like now where she sings all them jazz songs. Yeah. Uh, French. Val Valve Bone? Is that what yeah. it is? Such a great record. Yeah, I bought that at Amoeba. Well, you were making Knives Out at the time. This is a little over a year ago. Yeah. And then in December... I reached out to her and I said, it was, you know, it's just a year ago we were hanging out and Mike was making Knives Out and now it's out. And um, she, neither she nor I had seen it yet. And then when I saw it, I emailed her. I was like, I love this movie. I hope you get to see it. And she did. She, she finally saw it. Yeah, we were practicing for our Cars gig and you said to we should give send yeah. her a picture. Well, she's also uh, good friends with Morrissey and, and Matt, Matt Walker, who was playing drums with us that night works with Morrissey, so I knew that that was like the, the trifecta, the three, you know, uh, she would get a kick out of that. She, she did. She loved that picture. Oh, wow. So how long were you in Boston making that, making Knives Out? Was that a long shoot? No, no, that was, uh, that was not long at all. That was like a month or so. Man, that's one of those gigs you just really get lucky. It's just fun and everybody's so interesting and you don't have to like, get all neurotic about it and then and then you leave and then it this is really popular it's uh i got damn lucky on that one it felt fun that's nice to hear that it was actually fun yeah well the guy who made it ryan johnson he's a real kind of i mean meticulous and intelligent and he takes it seriously but he's a very easygoing kind of guy on set you know very laid back and he wrote it too he wrote it and he directed it. Was he making changes last minute? No. Stuck to it. No, a lot of the, the filmmakers I've worked with that that write, they don't mess around showing stuff to people unless it's unless they got it where they want it. Yeah. It's pretty airtight. They got their vision all put together and they're ready to go. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that <clears throat> Brett doesn't know what he's doing or something. It's just a different process, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's much more expensive, I would imagine. You definitely, you don't want to start shooting a movie without having a script that's worthwhile. Yeah. I am getting um, really dry yeah, in we my should, mouth. Let's take a break before we do the second hour and, <laughs> and third hour of this podcast. Mike, this was fun. Oh, thank you. Jason Narduzzi. Michael Shannon, thank you so much for joining us here on the Talk House Podcast. Go buy tickets to Verboten. If you don't live in Chicago, go buy plane, train, bus tickets to, to Chicago. Go see that show. Again, that's playing at the Chopin Theater through March 8th. A couple of names that came up in today's episode have worked with the Talk House before. Indeed. Go check out multiple episodes that we did with Knives Out's writer-director, Ryan Johnson, him in conversation with Tara Gilliam, and Anna Lily Amarpour. If it was Super Chunk that brought you to today's show, you can catch their drummer, John Worcester, in conversation with the late lamented Lil Bub. 
as well as frontman and Merge Records guru, Mac McCon, in conversation with Laura Cantrell. You can find those on TalkHouse.com or our SoundCloud page. Yeah, and one more thing, uh, as you heard in the podcast, these two were introduced by Robbie Folks, who has written a couple of amazing pieces for TalkHouse in the last year, one on Shania Twain and one recently on Gordon Lightfoot, who has had a more interesting life than you may have uh, thought. <laughs> I, I really want to encourage listeners who haven't yet to subscribe to the podcast because we have some insane episodes coming soon, including two collaborations with Murmur Lit, one featuring Judd Apatow in conversation with David Duchovny, another George Saunders in conversation with Dana Spiota, and on top of that, an upcoming talk between the band's Robbie Robertson and his Golden Messenger. Already in 2020, we've dropped shows featuring Blood Orange and Beverly Glenn Copeland, Susie Quattro and Dunita Sparks, and loads more greats. Today's episode was recorded by Stephen Shirk at his lovely Shirk Studios in Chicago. And we have to note that when Michael called it a dump, he was just kidding. It's a beautiful room. And also, of course, by Mark Yoshizumi at Hook and Fade Studios in New York. Famously also not a dump. <laughs> <laughs> We have some great pictures of Michael and Jason at Shirk Studios on our website, TalkHouse.com. And across all socials, that's at TalkHouse. Big thanks to our co-producer, Mark Yoshizumi. And the TalkHouse podcast theme was composed and performed by The Range. Till next week, I'm Ellie Einhorn. I'm Nick Dawson. And I'm Josh Modell. Peace. And for Bowden.